we knew that if, if, if we were to mess up, that it was back to people dying again. We were in a very, very dark, dark place and, and we got out of that. I can't think really of another major peace process that's been brought to a, to a clear fruition. This anniversary shouldn't be a victory lap. We need to look forward. It's a rather grand parliament building for a rather dysfunctional government. Sharing power doesn't come easily in a divided society. But that doesn't diminish the significance of a historic compromise 25 years ago. It largely silenced the guns and bombs and utterly transformed Northern Ireland. Carry on. It's the eve of Good Friday, 1998. Politicians are negotiating inside, a choir of Protestant and Catholic school children singing outside. The future's yours, and what we can do today is get a future that gives you a better chance of having a good life. Where are you see me? In the background, look at... Where are we? Oh, to the left of me going behind. You can just see the top of my hair. 25 years later, those school children are adults, reunited with the musician who brought them to Stormont to reminisce with us. I remember learning a song very quickly and being on the bus, lots of excitement. Didn't really know what to expect. Mm. And then we got there and there was this big, you know, loads of crowds and a bit, you know, uh, this is intimidating. <laughs> what, I, what, what's this all about? Yes. Everybody else's reactions telling me that these are, these are important people and something important is happening here and we've got our job to do in the day. Sing, smile and enjoy the day out. And yeah, just, I just remember it feeling special. No one wanted to leave at all that day because we knew some great thing had happened. Uh, Seamus Mallon later said that to hear the, inside of the talks, to hear the children singing, it is a defining moment in a way because this was the future calling upon them. Northern Ireland had endured 30 years of violence. Three and a half thousand lives lost. But IRA and loyalist ceasefires had facilitated peace talks. With the deadline for agreement fast approaching, the British and Irish Prime Ministers arrived in Belfast for one final push. A day like today, I mean, it's not a day for sort of sound bites, really. Um, we can leave those at home, but I feel, the, I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder. Were there conversations you were involved in that you've never spoken about in, in the run-up to the agreement? Uh, yeah, there was quite a few very private and difficult conversations. And really, part of it was trying to make sense of the opposing narratives of why we had reached this position and, and then trying to bridge the gap of trust that there was between those two opposing narratives and two opposing factions. And in that, the, the engagement with the, I mean, frankly, the people of violence was, was important. For the first time, the British government was engaging openly with Irish Republicans the Irish government holding meetings with loyalists. There were a good few, they were, they were secret. Um, they, they were secret, there were, uh, you know, even very few of my officials would have known that I had those, those, those meetings. Um, in fact, one of them was in a venue and I still can't find a venue. Um, so it was so secret I can't find a venue myself. <laughs> How does a Taoiseach disappear from their own delegation to go and meet with loyalists? Um, it, it, with great difficulty. <laughs> Much of the groundwork had been done by Mo Molum, her no-nonsense approach rather unconventional for a Northern Ireland secretary. Mo's contribution was, was immense because she was a, a complete culture shock. And, you know, I mean, for those of us who had lived through successive, very conservative-looking, very conservative, big C and small C, looking men who, who were secretaries of state for Northern Ireland. I mean, you know, a lot of them decent folk, but, you know, they, they were archetypal British politicians. 
and suddenly in steps Mo, um, who was the complete opposite. It was that effort to engage, like it's, it's so, we've all seen a lot of Secretary of State come and go and it was hard to see someone that would come in and plonk the legs up on the table and throw the hairpiece off and bang the table and kick doors and you know, <laughs> it was unusual to say the least. And the world's media descended on Northern Ireland in anticipation. The deal was on, then off, then hanging in the balance. The last sort of 24, 36 hours, apart from a wee bit of tidying up that had to be done at, a, at our end, it was, it was waiting for David Trimble. That, that's my sort of recollection. And I don't say that in any disparaging way. He had a, a, a big challenge. So it wasn't really until his death and I saw a lot of the, the footage of the battle within unionism that I, I, I realised that uh, you know, he, was, he was up against it. Nationalist leader John Hume had got Sinn Féin to the table. David Trimble's task to keep the Ulster Unionists there. Did he realise the price he would pay for reaching a compromise in the end? Possibly, possibly not. Uh, he knew that it was a big leap into the dark. He was taking a, a step that had never been taken before. Uh, but it was one that he felt had had to be taken. He knew that we needed an end to the conflict that we had had and uh, this was the best deal that he could obtain. It didn't give him everything that he wanted. It didn't give anybody everything that they wanted. Uh, but that's the nature of negotiation and uh, compromise. The deadline passed, but in the small hours of the morning, President Clinton intervened, speaking to party leaders by telephone. It was late afternoon when the President's peace envoy convened a plenary session. Would this be Northern Ireland's Good Friday? I'm pleased to announce that the two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. There are so few moments in politics where you, you are in a celebratory mood. So few moments that you remember those and remember them for all of your life and this was one of them. Perhaps, certainly, yeah, the most, the most joyful moment I ever had in my time in office. After a 30-year winter of sectarian violence, Northern Ireland today has the promise of a springtime of peace. The agreement that has emerged from the Northern Ireland peace talks opens the way for the people there to build a society based on enduring peace, justice, and equality. If your objective of Irish unity can be pursued politically as you decided on the basis of the agreement, how can you ever justify the violence that took place beforehand? Well, let's not talk about that, David, now. The fact is it happened. It's over, it's finished. Those who pursued armed actions from the Republican point of view felt they had no alternative. We provided an alternative. They embraced that alternative. The IRA went away. And I look on the, out in the Falls Road here and the sun's shining and, you know, and, and people are going about their business. I, I think about it 30 years ago. We were in a very, very dark, dark place in the 1970s and we got out of that. And David had a, a significant role to play in getting us out of that. How proud are you of David and his legacy? I am exceedingly proud, yes. Prisoners were released early and terrorists agreed to decommission weapons. Northern Ireland would have its own power-sharing government and would remain part of the UK until a majority voted otherwise. But that devolved government has collapsed numerous times and is currently mothballed over Brexit and its focus on the border. How capable are the political leaders of today of grasping the nuances of Northern Ireland and helping to resolve it? The best thing for political leaders today is to remember if they think the peace has been a good thing, it only came about because of leadership. It only came about because there were leaders prepared to be unpopular even with their own grassroots constituency or part of it 
And it only came about because there were leaders with the creativity and the imagination to say whatever the obstacles were going to find a way through it, and they found it. We were coming from a position where we knew that if, if, if we were to mess up, if we were to blow the opportunity, which we could have and maybe nearly did uh, several times, that it was back to people dying again. You know, it was back to, to murders and shootings. And, and you could imagine, and I often thought about this, imagine if it had went wrong at half five on Good Friday. What would have that weekend have been like in the north? Now it's in the hands of the people. They go to the polls next month. North and south of the border, they'll vote on this plan to bring them peace. A lot can change in 25 years, but perhaps what needs to change most is the agreement itself. By giving a veto to the largest unionist party and the largest nationalist party, it rendered middle ground votes of less value. So the mechanisms which underpinned peace have also been the cause of the political paralysis. But the children who sang outside the gates in 1998 still believe the Good Friday Agreement offers most hope for future generations. In my house, we see everybody as equal. Religion and politics are two different things. They don't come together and they shouldn't come together. Um, I think that's very important. Um, and if we don't set a good example, you know, then I think it's something that I definitely pass on to my boys and my children. You spend a bit of time together and those barriers come down, those stereotypes change, the perspective, their perception changes and you just see each other as people and kids just want to play together and, and sing together and, and have fun and once they, they're able to see they enjoy having fun too, it becomes a, a we and not a us and them. And those voices of yours are still echoing in my head after all these years. We can one more time. Carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. You can hear the people singing. Carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. Till peace will come again.